Hello, hello, hello. So, how are we doing? How is everybody? It's been a few weeks. Can somebody just let me know whether you can hear me okay? Always good to know, always get to, good to get that little bit of feedback to start with. So, who have we got? I know Billy's there. Steve, good afternoon, sir. Beautiful North Yorkshire, indeed. Funny old day, though. A bit grey, isn't it? Very grey. Can you hear me all right, Steve, by the way? Just put a yes. Hi. Just arrived. Good on you, Jenny. I might even mention the blink of an eye, Jenny, today, as you um, mailed that uh, message around earlier on. Good. Excellent. Good. Super, super. Okay. So we'll plough on. So, um, as you may have seen on the um, community tab, um, or somewhere, I put it somewhere, I'm not sure where I put it now, uh, these lives uh, on YouTube, what we're going to do is we're going to do these in the middle of the month, um, because the first thing, or the first Monday of every month now is the healing and meditation group, which I know some of you are involved in. Hello, gosh, all of you got smart in. Hello, nice to see you. Sunny in Somerset, you're lucky down south. Carol, hello, good to see you. I bet it's not sunny up in Scotland. Sally, good to see you. <laughs> JF, hey, good man. Hello, David. Yeah, poor old Billy. We'll try and move that on, perhaps. Keith, hello. Good. Yes, Wednesday, of course. <laughs> I sort of thought, what's happening on Wednesday? Oh, we know what's happening on Wednesday. It's going to be good. We'll talk about that in a second as well. So... Uh, so, first Monday of every month at about well, 6 o'clock BST in the afternoon is the Healing and Meditation Group. And we did the first one of those on the first, that was last week. Um, and then on a regular basis, what we'll do is these lives, 3.30, middle of the month. Um, and the last week of each month, I'm going to be doing other stuff. So, that's sort of the way that I think it's now going to pan out. It's taken me about 18 months to realise that that's probably the way that we should be doing things. Stevie, hello. Stevie, I think you missed our meditation group um, last time. I think you sent me an email about it, didn't you? Yeah, okay. But um, uh, one of the things is, for those of you that have signed up to the, the healing and meditation, um, I think I've sent around the, the recording of the session, so hopefully everybody's got that. Can you all put me, put my address in your um, safe, you know, categorize it as a safe uh, email because I know that some of you didn't get the mailing link etc that I sent out before that and it would have gone into spam so um yeah JF I'm hoping twice a month on YouTube to keep the freebies going there um just because it's a good a good uh, thing what's this what's the word for it uh community that's not what I mean it's you know we all keep this going um so yeah, so put me in your put my email address, tim.water at nightsrose.com or tim water777 at gmail uh, in your safe senders or safe receipts, and then you'll get the notification, get the reminders, which would be excellent. Um oh okay, oh that's right, no problem, Stevie. No, no, no. I was just concerned that those that had paid up uh, didn't show up. Um so that's fine. Um, it's, if anybody wants to come along that didn't come along, that's uh, £8.88 for the meditation. We spent, I think it was just over the hour last time, uh, really good. Um, what actually happened there was that we had uh, my guide came in and, and took the meditation, uh, which is always nice when he does that. It's always a bit, for me, touch and go whether he's going to show up or not, but he did. Um, so that worked really rather well. Which is lovely. I mean, of course, yeah, that's me, me, me giving opinion of them. Uh, how daft is that? Anyway, okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk in the usual live meandering chit chat way that we do. Hello. Yeah, West York, somewhere in West York. Well done for you. Good, good, good. That's Ikiriat Ceramics. Fantastic. Summer, hello. And Nancy, yeah, brilliant. Good to see you too. Lovely to see you. Um, yeah, no, I know. Yes, uh, J JF is also mod. Uh, there's no stress on JF. He can take his time um, with anything that uh, he wants to. I'm quite happy for uh, 
Billy obviously is going to take a back seat today. Quite happy that JF just sits and listens or whatever, contribute how you like, JF. Just because you have the moderator freedom, you don't need to get carried away, okay? So let's relax about that. So what I was saying was, so we've got the Zoom on the, the first Monday of the month. We're going to talk about Earth energy. We're going to talk about living sensitively. We're going to talk about what's going on in the world. Uh, undoubtedly, Merthyn will have some some something to say about that as well, I suspect, today. So we'll see whether he shows up or not. Um, it's fine. Uh, it's not a it's not a sideshow, is it? So, you know, if he shows up, he shows up. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Um, and we're going to talk some more about all of your questions. Paul, good to see you from Indiana. Good. And uh, Maeve, excellent. Sherwood Forest. Kitty Chris, hello. You've been on before. Good to see you again. Um, so do throw in the questions whenever you like and we'll meander to them. And anybody that doesn't like the lives, obviously, then they're not going to be here. But if they're watching it on playback, then it is very much a meandering chit chat. And there may well be an edited version of the highlights. Uh, just take a look on the playlist that is edited highlights of the lives. And that way you just get the nuggets rather than the chit chat. So, um, yeah, just to fill you in, just to finish filling, filling you in on what's going on in my world over here. Billy, relax. Just <laughs> so you've got a migraine. Stop it. Just sit down and relax. So um, in my world, we have the meditation. Um, next one of those is the 6th of July. OK, if you're interested in popping along to that 6th of July. And some of you, um, bless you, uh, two people in the household, if you both want to take part, not a problem. Just click the button once. You don't need to pay twice. Just click it once. OK, don't worry about that. Um, it's just useful. I'm, I'm charging because it's useful just to try and get some support for the channel. Obviously, there's a lot of interest. Um, and we're getting to a stage where actually I need some help on the channel in terms of editing and things like that. And if I want to get somebody else involved, I've got to pay them. So I have to kind of shift the, the stru charging structure a little bit. But that's OK. <laughs> Bless her. Stop it, Billy. You're going to just make yourself feel horrible. OK. I know it's up to you. I know. It's fine. So um, where are we? Yes, I know. The house healing course that um go on I've, I've, I've lost your name that was stupid me i'm oh, sorry I, I, i've completely i've completely gone blank on who it was that mentioned the uh keith keith right the house healing course that we advertised a little while ago um is is great we, we're doing the first one on wednesday and um, we, we, I wanted six people to make it viable. We've got eight, which is fantastic, except one lady has just pulled out today. So if you want, if you want to be, if you want, if anybody wants to join us for this session, it starts on Wednesday, 10 months, and I take the group, and hopefully there'll be eight at that time, through everything I know about house healing. So it basically is to get you to a stage where you can um, be a professional house healer if you want to be using the method that I use, which is a slight variation on that that has been introduced by Adrian and Corbett Weber, which is going back on the, the shoulders of giants like Hamish Miller and uh, all of those greats. So anybody that might be interested in that, there is just one place that has become available today. If you want to uh, ask about that and inquire about it, it's 10 months. £160 a month, and it's payable monthly, so it's not a big lump sum. Drop me a line. Uh, you've got it there. Uh, if you um, Drop me a line. Actually, if JF, if you want to pop up a link to the house healing course, which is near that on the website, uh, that'd be great. So that's the housekeeping out the way. Other things that we are doing, there's a lot going on now. Um, I, I'm trying to set up a few more conversations, a few more interviews with people with, in the wellness area. And one of the ones that I, I, I'm having a chat with my, believe it or not, with my brother. I have a brother who's two years older than me. 
And it's relevant to what we discuss on this channel uh, about the subtle realms and about life changes and the way that life can really take the ups and downs. Because Steve um, actually had a nervous breakdown or two, he was diagnosed as bipolar. And all of that happened for him about the same time as I was going through the massive change of encountering the spirit in the house and thinking that I was actually losing touch with reality. So it's really interesting to talk to Steve. And actually, um, I'm hoping to record that interview with him on Thursday. And I do think that it's going to be very, very valuable for anybody that is actually affected by um, mental health issues. Steve is very open about wanting to talk about mental health and about his experiences to help other people um, and also to open up the door on this uh, you know supposedly taboo subject which is a nonsense of course because any of us are susceptible to mental health and for me it's relevant to what we talk about on this channel because when we open up spiritually what can happen is that we get spiritual shock which can take us very very close to experiencing reality in a very similar way to somebody that the mainstream medical profession would say they are having a psychotic episode. So we need to be really careful. And this is why I go on about not only protection, but also about being incredibly grounded. It's really important that anybody that embarks on the spiritual path, uh, if it comes in too fast, too soon, they need to be as grounded as possible. Okay, And that, that way you can progress safely and at your own time. Um, so that's a really exciting interview that we're going to have. I'm still trying to chase the track down, not track down, I'm still trying to nail down Matthew Manning. Uh, he's a really busy guy. I really want to speak to him. He's a, a UK healer, um, very interesting guy. I want to speak to him. There's also a dream, a lucid dream expert, a guy called Charlie Morley that some of you might know about. Lovely fella. I've had some contact with him. He's willing to have a chat, but we've kind of lost it. We haven't been able to arrange a time to have an interview. But I'm really interested in talking to Charlie because he is dealing and using lucid dreaming as a way of overcoming uh, post-traumatic stress and this sort of thing. And we're going to touch on, I think, shortly in this session today, a little bit about the idea of, of looking at life actually more as a dream state because... I'm still trying to work out a way of getting across succinctly what um, the re reality of living intentionally and working with the subtle energies and working in the moment really can mean for people, right? Um, so, hello, Brad. Good to see you there. Uh, thank you, JF, for putting up that link. One, well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, anybody that wants to ask, um, uh, okay, that's fine, uh, Billy, I don't know what the um, specific issue is, that one, you might have mentioned that to me before. Anybody that wants to ask me a specific question, please put at Tim Walter and it really jumps out in the chat, okay? So... Those are the people that I want to talk to, and um, we'll get them up on the stream. I'm doing some interviews with a channel that's called Total Wellness Club. That's run by a guy called Neil Fellows. I've known Neil for some time. He's uh, bringing together a lot of health well-being professionals, and uh, he's doing a new series of videos. So uh, I'm going to be contributing to that channel um, you know, on a sort of semi-regular basis here coming up. So there's lots of really interesting stuff coming on. Um, and apart from that, of course, still continuing to work with uh, house healing clients. But let's see. Um, Ian, hello. Popped you an email. Not sure whether you would have got it by now, but let's uh, connect on that. Because Ian is another fella that I want to talk to on the channel. Because Ian has a really interesting um, uh, take on reality. And he was trained as a scientist. And that's always really lovely to meet scientific thinkers that are also very open to the spiritual stuff, uh, spiritual stuff. So um, Ian will be great. He's a really good communicator. So, <laughs> so we'll see We'll see when we can get him on as well. So quite an eclectic mix, really. Um, so, right. Now, the question that we um, are going to sort of spring everything from today is... Um, it's this one, which actually is also provided by a scientific thinker. 
and I think I don't think he'll mind me um, describing him. I think a lot of a lot of you know one of the things I wanted to touch on today actually was the way that our mode of thinking, the way that we think, um, becomes a habit, and you know. Uh, obviously, we're born with certain character types, and so I mean, I'm quite a creative, uh, scatter brain. You know, it's I'm, my thoughts are all over the place. They're not very structured and logical, um, which is fine. You know, that we get used to the way that we think, don't we? Um, and it's the habit that we'll talk about in a little while about sort of that retains us in the the personality that we are living with and kind of habitual through habit move into as well as we go through the decades. But so this this fella, I won't say his actual name, but he asked a question which was that dowsing was originally for water and ore, right? So very practical applications. When and how and why did all this spiritual idea, this stuff like protection and permission, when did that come in to dowsing? So uh, this guy struggles uh, sometimes with, with a lot of the spiritual uh, stuff because his way of thinking is that he likes to know where is the evidence for X, Y, Z. And that's, that's fine. But, you know, we're not saying one way of thinking is right, one way of thinking is wrong. So it's a really good question. And it is, again, I'll just repeat it. Dowsing was originally for water and ore. When and how and why did all this spiritual uh, kind of concept uh, the stuff about protection and permission, where did that come in and why? That's the gist of it. So I think one of the things is that um, uh, sorry, just reading Billy's comment there. Um, I haven't seen that, Billy, no. Uh, Mind Panda. Okay, cool. Anyway, so uh, I don't mind if you've got a link for that as well, Billy, chuck it up there. That's fine. Um, okay, so I think actually that this this question from from this fellow is a, is actually slightly coming up on the wrong foot because actually yes, if you look at the oldest references to dowsing in what we might call ordinary publications, then yes, it's talking about dowsing for ore, dowsing for, you know, coal and minerals and tin. Um, and in Germany, dowsing for all sorts of things. Germany was a was a, a major center of dowsing for some reason, or it seemed to have been very open about it. And so it was used for a long time in the kind of industrial, commercial, you know, environment. But actually, if you think about it, we'll mention the W word here, witchcraft, right? Now, witchcraft is 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 actually dealing with subtle energies. It's just a different approach to it. It doesn't mean to say witchcraft is a bad thing at all. You know, like all of this stuff that we talk about, um, it's it's up to the individual aspect of the creative force. In other words, what we are, it's up to the individual how they're using their ability to tune into the subtle energies and to man to manipulate. I will say manipulate because. That's what we're doing. We're asking upstairs to, to take action, to move things, to change things. So if you like, what I teach in the mentoring is a framework that is the house healing framework. But, you know, somebody else could be doing a Wiccan course, a witchcraft course, and they would be learning very, very similar technique, but with different labels, right? So dowsing, the art of finding hidden things, as it used to be called, has always been in a slightly different arena connected to the spiritual, because it's always been about finding the hidden things, to utilizing the sixth sense. So I think that it's an interesting question, but it's really coming from this fella's perception of the way that he sees the world and the way that he's had um, uh, information come to him. Let's pause for a moment there. Ian, you were able to find your septic tank the other weekend using those dowsing rods. Excellent. Had to dig down two feet to get at it, but at least you found it first time. Fantastic. Excellent. That is that is very good. It, um, uh, Ian made a, a set of dowsing rods out of a wire coat hanger, 
Um, if any of you have seen a recent video that I put up, I'm doing a, a sequence of videos about learning to douse. I'm just breaking it down into very simple fundamentals. Uh, Ian, I don't think has seen that one, but I actually have got a bit of wire um, that I demonstrate how to make a set of dowsing rods with. Um, Ian said that his, uh, hello Tom, good to see you, said that his rods were a bit sort of Heath Robinson, a bit makeshift, but if you watch the video, learn to douse step one, you'll see some real Heath Robinson wire, very dodgy looking things. But anyway, it's a bit of fun, but it is helpful. So do check that out as well. So coming back to dowsing here. So there's always been this aspect that connects with the spiritual because it connects with the sixth sense. And the sixth sense, of course, has always been considered to be mystical. And this is why we go into the spiritual, the mystical, the spiritual, the esoteric. I think esoteric is an appropriate word. But it's always, always been connected with the intuition in both camps. It's just that you're not going to find somebody that goes out and reads you know, in the in the 1900s or the late 1800s, a book about dousing for minerals is not necessarily going to be going out and, you know, learning witchcraft or, you know, picking up the word about witchcraft. So there are two different, completely different audiences in which dousing has developed. Because, you know, I say it all the time, don't I, that dousing is not, it's not actually magical, mysterious or or something that is unusual. It's a very... It's a God, God given, okay, we're going to call it God given. It's a God given ability as part of being human. And actually, what we discuss here is the fact that it makes the whole concept of being human really rather interesting and exciting because it enables that intuitive aspect to be really worked with. And when we start to lever it, that's when things really start to change. So I think, in answer to his question, um, I don't think it is um, a, a linear change. I think they both came along at once uh, and as always have been there. It's just that the, the, the publications that highlight one aspect are certainly not going to highlight the other. Now, don't forget, divination and, and dowsing has been tied up with witchcraft over the centuries because it was uh, listed as part of the various Witchcraft, witchcraft acts here in the UK for sure. Now don't let this put any of you off because it's only, a, as we said, it's about the individual use of the skill and what you do with it. Um, yes, absolutely, Keith. Uh, you know, Keith's asking there, could our house healing intent be part of the client's sole purpose? Yes. This is one of the things that I... Um, uh, the, the, one of the things that we'll touch on, Keith, in the course is that actually we're looking at everything um, in the house healing mode in the context of the client relationship and you become, as the house healer, part of that client's soul journey because it's a, usually a spiritual encounter that they're having trouble with. They go and find an appropriate house healer. What you bring to that set of circumstances is your knowledge and your position and that for you will be part of opening up and development. This is why we, we cover a lot of self-development work within the course, right? So yes, really good, really good point. Um, uh, reversal points, well, gee, yes. Okay, let's come to that. Remind me a bit later on, Tom, because that's a very specific question. Um, it, it's, yeah, you, I mean, we can, we can go through it, but let's do that a little bit later and remind me before we get to the end of the session, okay? So, um coming back to this particular question then yeah so so he asked specifically about you know he's picking up on protection and permissions uh when we're doing healing with dowsing um we are to a certain extent asking permission I, I, again i go into detail about that and, and why i say to a certain extent um but if you ever take a dowsing course a learn to douse course from an institution like the BSD or the American Society for Dowsers, what you'll be taught in those official um, uh, courses, um, lessons, is to, before you pick up the rods and ask a question, they say, you ask the permission, you ask, may I douse this, should I douse this, and can I douse this? 
Now, I don't follow that teaching. I don't go along with that because it's, it, I've seen it used as a, as a method for basically a dowser to, to beat themselves up with. And usually, you know, it ends up quite often with the individual actually not being able, not being allowed to do dowsing. However, there are, there are there is a place for that sort of permission asking, uh, and that is in the the way that I've been talking about it here and te teaching you guys is that if you get if you start dousing and you get all sorts of nonsense results, nonsense answers, or even the rods don't move necessarily. Let's say if you're using rods, that they might not even respond at all. Then in that sort of circumstance, it is actually can be very useful to ask them, may I douse this, should I douse this, can I douse this? Because that not only helps you focus, but it's also ask, also ask, giving you a better connection to actually just ask and put a framework around why in this position, in this context, is it not working? And what you'll usually find is that actually, upstairs or your subconscious wants to make a point, okay? So there, there is a role for that sort of permission in it. Now, what he's saying is, what this guy's saying is, what, when did all that come in? Well, I don't know when it started to come in, but obviously, whenever we're doing any kind of healing work, then we are either asking permission of the individual, and obviously when a client comes to us, with you know, that's the consent is given, um, and if we're doing healing on the family, then consent is given via the person that we're talking to. Or, you know, the obvious is just simply ask upstairs, and you could do it as part of the can I manage, you know, may I, should I, uh, three questions, but you can just simply ask, do I have permission to, to do some work for this person? Simple, straightforward question to ask. Tammy, good to see you. Uh, yep, that's fine. Uh, I ask if I am Tammy. All oh, right, okay. You've got a no for the answer. Uh, <laughs> well, so, Tammy, interesting point, because... I think we've covered off that, that question that was, was raised for us. Um, and one of the things that I have been thinking about a lot recently is actually the nature of the individual. Um, I'm, I'm still thinking about Tom's question, uh, so don't, I haven't forgotten, Tom, but we'll come back to that in a sec. So, um, Tammy, if you douse and you get am I, then... You see, this, what this illustrates is actually the way that we, as human beings, put so much value on the label of me. So me, Timothy John Water. Am I Timothy John Water? Yes, I am. I believe I am. But I'm not. I'm not. Because what I am is what we've discussed before, which is... Uh, yes, exactly, JF. You've got it there. You are so much more than just uh, than just the name. So that's the point. And same with Billy. Same with all of us. This is the point. When we talk here in these lives about being the point of awareness for the universe, that's what we are. The universe creates us. I mean, you know, literally, if you think back to that moment, you know, pre conceptual point there's a there's a, a a process that goes on that we have no idea about when we're in this realm but when we get back there we know for sure that yeah there's something that goes on and we are created by the universe and, and we are these points of awareness so that's tammy there's billy there's tim there's tom there's ian different points of awareness as with these fingers, you know, I could have arthritis in one of these fingers. I mean, I haven't, but thank goodness. But I, but I could have, and that would influence the way that my finger was perceiving the reality that I was in touch with. Okay, so if you think of each of these as being an individual, that it doesn't mean to say that this is, you know, Tim Walter isn't just Tim Walter doesn't exist. I don't exist. Ninety nine point nine percent of me is space. 99.99% of me is space. 99.99% of everybody is simply nothing. And what makes us is the, the whirling vortices of the energy that forms the atomic structures. Now, don't forget that atoms, if you think about atoms, we think about these lovely illustrations of, of spheres 
uh, illustrated as uh, ping pong balls or billiard balls, you know, and, and on television you'll get them describing things by rolling billiard balls along a, a billiard table, snooker table. That's not what atoms are like at all. Atoms are simply vortices whirling at ridiculous speeds. And actually, science, and Ian can either um, check this out, uh, reinforce this or not, but um, uh, science often refers to the, 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 the particle actually as just a, an excitation within the zero point field, within the quantum field of possibility. So all we are is lots of excitations within the field of energy, within the field of possibility, which brings me back to the expression that Jenny, who's having trouble with the echoes on the line, um, uh, the expression in the blink of an eye, which apparently was about change that the Buddha uh, mentioned. Now, this is, this is really, 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 uh, really, I mean, Tammy, it's absolutely lovely that you mentioned this, right? Because it's so appropriate. Because we think of change as human beings, as, as, as in our perception of self, we think of change as being something that happens over a long period of time because we see and we witness other people growing old and we witness the sun coming up every 24 hours and things change. But in the blink of an eye, actually, in, I mean, I can't verify that this actually refers, this is what Buddha was actually referring to, but actually change is possible in the blink of an eye. Change is taken at that moment in less than the blink of an eye. The quantum field where everything stems from, is constantly refreshed. All these excitations that we consider to be particles are constantly, constantly refreshed. Things are going in and out of our presence. These vortices are constantly being generated and disappearing. I mean, the, the, the atoms in the body are constantly appearing and disappearing far, far quicker than the blink of an eye. And in each moment, we are given the chance to make a choice. And this is why we've said it so many times, and it's fine to repeat it because it needs repeating to be understood and to be lived by. Every change and every choice can occur within the blink of an eye. A blink of an eye can change a life. If you're, actually decide, if you're an alcoholic and you decide, no, then you can change the rest of your life with that. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. Obviously, in that example where somebody is racked by addiction, it is going to take more than just a decision to say no. But, you know, as an illustration, you get what I mean. I had an experience when I was at Avebury, that Avebury Henge, uh, probably a couple of decades ago now, I get confused about my own timeline. Um, where I stood at the, the it's a really big crossing centre at Avery Henge. I mean, it's an ancient, ancient sacred site in the UK. You, I used to go there a lot. And this was at a time in my life when I was really working closely and trying to really develop this relationship with Mirth and my guide. And I leant against the, 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 the you know, one of the really big rocks, really big stones at, at the, the major centre that is still existing. I mean, I'm kind of hesitating because there are so many ways that the site has changed over the millennia uh, that it, it, I'm referring to what is there now. And I also want to avoid using the word power centre because that's going to get you confused about Earth Energy Power Centre. It wasn't. But what it was was a major, major crossing point of um, Earth Energy, but very, very powerful. And what Merlin said to me in that moment was as I was, I, I was standing with my back to the stone and looking directly at the sinking sun. And he said, we're gonna take you away for a moment. And as soon as he said that, I went like, what, what? 
and there was a, and I was like, what's going, what's going to happen? I was expecting to disappear. Uh, you know, in this, in my mind's eye, I thought he's going to suddenly remove me from the physical realm. Now, what he said, and uh, nothing happened as far as I was concerned. I, I just stood there and was just looking out at this amazing sun, sunset. And, um, and you know, maybe 30 seconds, if that, later he said, that's fine, you, you know, we're done. Um, and quite frankly, what he was said later was, well, we took you away, but you didn't even notice. You did, it happened so fast that you didn't even notice. And this was before I understood about this whole blink of an eye notion. And when you think about it, I know, you know, I, I mean, sure, you know, <laughs> uh, I could have just been standing there having this delusional fantasy, but it wasn't. So there's a teaching in there uh, for those of us that want to pick it up, that we can change at any moment, at any moment. Okay. And, that, and that's, and that's the, the, it, it is our... It is our human energy, our human self, our desire to retain and to remain in the energy that we acknowledge and label as the self that stops those moments of change, both being present, being available to us through our conscious awareness, in other words, we're not mindful of them. It's our habitual state of being that stops us being aware of those moments for change. Because in theory, if we're, if we're trying, if we're on a path of healing, then every moment is significant and important because you are trying, we are trying to change the way we think. Now, in order to change the way we think, we have to be separate from the process of thinking. In order to change the way we think, we have to be separate from the thinking, because otherwise you cannot influence it. You cannot influence something by being in the same habitual way of thinking. Okay? Well, it is profound, but it's it, it, it is profound, but it is also very very simple, Tammy, isn't it? You know, because it, 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 you know this is the, the, what I've been talking about. There is actually um, the fundamentals of Joe Dispenza's work, where he talks very uh, succinctly and very knowledgeably about the ability of the brain to go into a state of of mild hypnosis, self hypnosis meditation, readjust because it then connects with the quantum level of existence, which is what we've been talking about for some, you know, some time, eight months, you know, 18 months or so, then, on and off. And in that process, in that state of being where you're actually ignoring the self and you are open to all possibilities, then you can make the changes. It's like going into the space, it's like going into a garage and, and picking up new tools and equipment to build the new self from. So I'd recommend, hello Joseph, good to see you, good to see you. I'd recommend um, you know, any of you that are interested in that sort of thinking and that sort of way of working with your own energy and your own mindset. And don't forget, this is what we're talking about, is changing the life in which you live. So it's changing the reality that you experience, okay? Because the only way you change the reality that you experience is by changing your self so um yeah yes that's exactly right tom exactly right exactly right let me just cover off your question from earlier on while we're while we're there uh reversal points so um tom has been reading um the heal your home book that adrian wrote some years ago and um i'll come back to that uh, I'll come back to you, Kinney Chris, shortly. Um, and one of the aspects that we find in house healing work, uh, sometimes, I have to say it's not very common, is something that's called a reversal point. Now, this was something that was discovered by a dowser in Ireland called Billy Gorn. And Billy Gorn was of the same generation as Hamish Miller. 
they were good friends. They knew each other through the British Society of Dancers. I spoke to Billy once on the phone when I first met Hamish. Uh, Hamish recommended I had a chat with him. And, you know, it was Billy that actually put my mind at rest because to start with, when the world was changing so much for me, I was quite scared, quite fearful about, oh, am I going to get possessed or what's going on? What's, what's this weirdness? happening and Billy actually said look just chill just relax <laughs> because he said in the natural world if you look at the natural world everything grows everything is you know not everything but I mean what he said was most things grow most things flourish and develop and that's the purpose that's the driving energy it's not like the world is riddled with detrimental land destroying aspects so, and he was a guy that worked with the land a lot in terms of he had a small holding and this sort of thing. And so um, he was a very wise dancer. Uh, and he put my mind at rest with this simple observation, you know, and if you look in the garden, and especially in the spring, goodness me, it's just positivity coming up. And yeah, of course you get the negative stuff. You get some what we call negative fungus attack and things like that. But, you know, it's part of the whole mix. So positivity yeah we'll come back to kinney chris in a sec so um reversal points is what billy gorn discovered and what it is is that basically uh what appears to be the case is that if you look at a surface a two-dimensional surface which we would regard as the floor of a building then you can have a certain specific area which is absolutely fine not causing anybody any harm at all, right? Bearing in mind that a lot of what we're looking at in the house eating world is causing people issues. So that, that position, let's say it's about the size of a waste paper basket or something like that, okay, that spot is absolutely fine until somebody comes along and puts something on it. So you can put, let's say you put a, uh, a TV, somebody might want to put a TV there. So that's electrical, but it doesn't make any difference. It could just be a cupboard. Somebody wants to put a cupboard in a new place and they put it on this spot. What happens? Well, the detrimental aspect that is then derived from the reversal point is not necessarily occurring at that position. In fact, it doesn't. That's what makes the reversal point unique. It, the detrimental aspect doesn't occur where that cupboard has been put over the point. It pops up somewhere else. If you imagine it's like, you know, imagine you've got, uh, like, I don't know, I, mean, I can't think. So, well, if you've got a handful of clay, wet clay, and you squidge it, it's like some comes out the top, some comes out the bottom. That's a bit what it's like. It's like the detrimental aspect doesn't occur where you're there. It occurs out the top somewhere else. What the detrimental effects are varies person to person, family to family, whatever. Uh, whoever's affected by the ge geopathic stress within the house. But fundamentally, that's the point, Tom. Does that make sense? So it's not going to happen where, uh, uh, it, let's say, there's a spot in the living room, um, something's put on that spot, okay, the detrimental energy might come up in the hallway, for example, or it might come up outside. So what we usually do when we highlight these on floor plans is to say, right, spot A there, Spot B, which is connected to A, is over there, and the, the two are connected, right? That's what a reversal point is. Okay. So let me just come back to what we were talking about, which was the mind. Kinney Chris, the mind using language is significantly different from the mind being directly present. Does that, yeah, we, uh, I get what you're getting at. Uh, the language, because language is simply symbolic. And what you're talking about is the mind being directly present is being a state of awareness. So it's the state of awareness that is that is actually the state that you're trying to get to. That's what I would argue or suggest is the state of awareness so that you can then actually change. You bring about your change through the emotional change that you want to achieve. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, I mean, I think that we're on the similar wavelength there. Uh, let me know if that's not what you were getting at. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so, the nature of the individual. So, coming back to all of this stuff, because what, we look, what we've looked at is um, the notion that change can occur at any moment. 
And we've also looked at the fact that it's our habitual state of being that tends to keep repetitive patterns in place. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, and I was, I was taking it to the point where uh, we would want to change the self. Um, so, change is available every moment and don't think that change has to take a long time. Now, the problem is that um, the important thing is for somebody that's going through healing is to be able to kind of notice that they are changing. Because again, when you are in the experience as, um, as the person that is, is experiencing the healing, the person, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm battling, let's, let's use Tom, I don't think Tom will mind. Um, Tom and I are doing some work together and Tom is, is making really, really good progress at, um, at improving and becoming a, a far more healthy and um, well-balanced individual, a well-balanced set of energies. But the important thing is, in, for anybody in that position, is that they can see that they are making progress so that they are constantly on a forward trajectory to wellness, to that point of betterment. I'm not going to say being better because I'm not sure, you know, I still regard myself as a uh, work in progress. I'm still, I'm still working on my baggage, the emotional baggage. And I still I say that we all are. I don't think that we ever finish, to be honest. Not in one lifetime, but there you go. So, but the point is, on a on a practical human level, uh, every individual that is is going through the healing, what you need to do is to be able to uh, assist them in seeing that they are making change. And the best way for that is for the individual to keep a record of it, of course, keep a journal, so you can look back. You know, look back a couple of weeks, and you go, "Whoa, dear me, that was not good." Um, I'm not quite sure why I got onto record keeping. Somebody remind me. I think, I've, I think I've lost the track, I've lost the plot. Um, so, yeah, okay, so, so what it was, yeah, that's right. So on the human perspective, the healing, if you've been suffering from something for a long time, for, for let's say 20 years, then it's not going to necessarily, it's not, from a human perspective, we find it so difficult to allow the magic of quantum perceptive change to occur in, in a short space of time it's because the habit of the individual and the habit of the physical world, which is designed to keep everything in physical form, because otherwise we'd just be in spirit, but we're not, we're in physical form. So those are the limiting factors and therefore change, if somebody has been suffering for 20 years, change is probably going to take a good, you know, some time. It's going to take some time. Not necessarily going to take 20 years, but it could take five. We don't know. What's happening with Tom is um, he's working really fast. He's doing really good stuff. And the reason that Tom's able to move really quickly um, to a, a state of betterment, to improvement, is because actually he's, he is his intention is so focused on change and on improvement and getting back to a state of well-being. So he is doing a lot of work and it's, and it's, it's, it's showing results. I'm sorry, Tom, I hope you don't mind me talking about you like that. It's, you're just a really good example of somebody that is really rolling forward really, really well. Now, all of this stuff, uh, we talk about dowsing, we talk about healing, we talk about self-awareness, we talk about um, the, uh, the oddities of earth energy and ley lines and reversal points and all this stuff. But all of it, as you'll gather, we try to come at it all from a, spirit, uh, from a scientific or a logically minded, grounded point of view, right? So the three people that I would like you as well as people like Joe Dispenza, but we'll come back around to Joe Dispenza in a second. But if you want to learn more about any of this stuff, 
then um, <laughs> um, is Google or, or have a look on YouTube the work of Dean Radin. He's he's an absolute classic. Uh, somebody that approaches what he refers to as sci research from a scientific perspective, and he's been doing it for for decades, and consequently. In the certainly in the early decades, came in for a lot of stick from the scientific community for what he was doing, but he's had some incredibly interesting results, mainly about the sort of capability of the human being on the subtle levels, which is about telepathy and that sort of thing, information exchange in a non-verbal way. So, <clears throat> so that's Dean Radin, really good to look up. The second one I've talked about him before is Donald Hoffman. He's an American cognitive psychologist. I have to read what he is. He's um, like like a lot of these people on YouTube. He's very good at communicating. So a lot of scientists these days have realised that if they want to get their work out and to get noticed um, um, for the, I mean, for a lot of it, it's for the betterment of so many individuals. Because what's happening is the information that neuroscientists and um, quantum biologists, etc., are learning now is getting to the public domain far, far quicker. It has its drawbacks as well, which if we've got time, we might touch on in a sec. But Donald Hoffman is a brilliant communicator. His book was The Case Against Reality, The Case Against Reality. Very interesting, but it does get a little bit dry in the middle. But it is really about the illusory nature of this world that we live in and how it is that actually, based on the laws of the Darwinian laws of survival of the fittest, which science takes as being gospel, you know, as being, <laughs> that's a really bad expression, science takes as being uh, the, the way that things happen. Um, so he's using a scientific method to explain that actually there is, a, there is an advantage to the fact that we live in this illusory and symbolic environment that we co-create and that we experience as symbolically, okay? So interesting concept. And the other guy, if anybody's interested in this, is, yep, that's it, neuroplasticity, is uh, Vlatko Vedral, Professor of Quantum Information Science at the Oxford University. Now, what he does is he's, he's great. Uh, I haven't watched a lot of his stuff. I've seen a little bit. So if you dig him out, Vlatko Vedral, Professor of Quantum Information Sciences at Oxford University. He asks the big questions and has some really interesting theories and is really good at explaining the role of the observer. And actually, if anybody's still online, um, yes, David Bohm, but I know so little about it, but Ian, you can talk about David Bohm uh, when we do our interview. Um, if anybody, if uh, Keith, if you're still online, we'll be talking more about this. these people, and I know you've got the list and you've started probably ordering those books. Um, so we'll be going into their work a little bit, a little bit. Um, I let you do most of the reading on that stuff. Um, and then there's a guy called Konstantin Korotkov, Dr. Konstantin Korotkov. And he is actually a computer scientist. And he's in Moscow, I think it is, or Munich. Not sure. He's Russian, basically. Great name. Um, he invented a device called the GDV machine. Uh, and that measures, as far as I understand, it measures biophoton emissions, in other words, light from organic matter. So in other words, it's like a massively uh, exaggerated Curlian photographic system. Now, it's not like some of these computer-based systems that you see online. Um, Harry Oldfield had a system which was not really, well, nothing compared to this, to be honest. I mean, Harry's a lovely guy, and there's been a lot of confusion and controversy around what Harry Oldfield developed. But most of what um, Harry Oldfield says about his system is is valid other people put things onto it if you see what i mean google harry oldfield as well but don't get too carried away with what other people say about his work but this guy dr konstantin korotkov really 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 interesting man in terms of his research into the possibilities of us as organic mechanisms and our electrical energy fields now, he's also really, really interesting from our point of view as, as, as house healers and people that work with geographic stress because his work in the early 2000s 
was um, all done with the scientific method where he basically has shown that areas of geopathic stress will deplete the human energy field. And this has been verified with the computer and scientific method. And so he's a really interesting man, a really interesting to, to look up. Yes, Carol. Um, the other interesting thing from a personal note about Konstantin Korotkov is that I, in the, in the uh, must have been about, 2000, about 10 years ago, I was doing some filming for a producer who had interviewed him. Um, I was also editing that particular uh, set of programs. And so I edited an interview with Konstantin Korotkov, but it was only last week when I realized how much work he had done on geopathic stress. Now talk about coincidence, synchronicity, all this sort of stuff, just didn't realize. Um, yeah, you need to be a little bit careful about some of those curly and photography stuff, uh, Billy, because some of them actually, they purport to be curly and photographs, whereas they're not. And the, uh, this is what I was saying about Harry Oldfield, uh, computer imaging. It's, it's, it's working with the, what Harry Oldfield does is work with the light being reflected off a person. And he's got the various algorithms that process the, the image slightly differently. But, uh, and this is not to dismiss the work of Harry Oldfield because it can be used in therapy. It can be used in, um, uh, you know, somebody's uh, diagnosis, method of diagnosis, but there's a certain kind of protocol and learning to go along with that. But equally, you know, if we take a Photoshop image of somebody and manipulate it in different ways with different algorithms in the Photoshop, then you end up with an image that looks just like a Harry Oldfield photo. Not to say that somebody using the Harry Oldfield system is not capable of diagnosing issues. Okay, I'm just saying, just be a little bit careful about what you're dealing with and what you're looking at. Because curly in photograph actually will be where the hand, for example, is put on a plate an electro, a, a photographic plate, and the image and the light field will be shown around the hand and the fingers. And again, you take a leaf and you put it on the plate and you'll see the, the life force, as it were, the light coming from it. And what Konstantin Korotkov's GDV machine does is, because they've done so many tests and measures on, on individuals, I mean, I think it's thousands of individuals basically to build up a picture, they can now represent it graphically as you know, somebody's life force, their electrical field can be represented graphically. Uh, so that's really interesting. And it can also register electrical fields, very subtle electrical fields within a room. So very interesting. Thank you. Well done, JF, you found it. Uh, well done, Billy. So um, the last thing I want to leave you with, I just want to touch on this because we are on the half past, not that it matters, but I want you to, <clears throat> because we talk, on, all, on everything on this channel is about relating it to practical terms. What can I do with it? What are we talking about here? What can I do with it? How do I apply it to my life? And at the moment, we're on the outflow, we hope, of the COVID-19 issue. It doesn't matter whether we think the COVID-19 was created deliberately, has been a social experiment, doesn't matter. What matters more than anything else, and you know what I'm going to say, is how you make your choices in each moment, in the blink of each moment, when you come into contact with information to which you react. Now this applies for our friends in America, particularly at the moment, with the, uh, the Floyd killing in particular. I think it's very, very, very interesting that as we 
get through nine weeks or whatever of lockdown. And in a country where 100,000 people have died from the virus, if that be a true figure, which it probably is, that the, the what comes up for the, for the nation and the world is the racism, is the abuse that we will do to each other. And what does that tick off? That ticks off the fear, the insecurities. I mean, those are the two symbolic things. I mean, God forbid, don't get me wrong. I'm really, I mean, I'm appalled by what happened and obviously our sympathies go to, uh, you know, it's easy for me as a white man to be very dismissive. And I mean, not dismissive, I don't, I'm not dismissive. It's just how, what right have I got as a white man to actually say, have any comment on this situation? Because it's it's a it's an outrage, uh, and it's time it's time you know it's time it stopped, and that's the whole point. And really, if the virus, if COVID nineteen has done nothing else but to catapult the atrocity of racism and interhuman hatred for no reason whatsoever, if it's catapulted that into the forefront of so many people's thinking then that is a great aspect of healing in itself so what do we do with the information when it comes to us when we see the atrocity uh, on the news or you know as we said before in any media that comes into our minds the media is a blunt tool you know i've said before try to dis not dismiss it i've tried to to say don't consider it at the same level as your interactions that come to your awareness. Um, yeah, okay, Tammy, so you're right in it there, you see. So so um, thanks, um, uh, Billy, for the, the time check. Um, I just want to finish this off. So Tammy, for example, if she stepped out in downtown St. Louis, then she could encounter face to face the aggression of the riot police or whatever they are now. So in her example, then that aggression and that violence is right there in that in her reality. For me, I'm looking at it on television. And I've said in the past to say, well, that, that's not as influential when you look at it on the TV. But actually what it is, it's, it's, it is less influential to, to consider it as being less influential on that spiritual level of what's occurring. But actually what it is for all of us, media is such a blunt object. It hurts. What happens is that the stuff that comes out of the media is actually really, really blunt in its power. I mean, I'm saying the universe, it, it communicating, reflecting back to us. And so it reflects back the unease, the fear, the violence, the hatred, all of which is within the individual. I'll, I'll you know, stick my hand up and say, I've, I've, you know, I've, a part of my baggage is all in all of those headings, if I want to, different levels of, you know. And so this is why maybe we can start to look at the media as being that blunt object of uh, appalling influence that we have the choice to decide how we react to it. I've said, I've said that, I've said that so many times, but I think that, I think that what I would leave you with is the question of whether um, you are, whether, whether looking at and considering media, whether it be on the news, on TV, broadcast TV or internet, I mean, you know, or magazine, newspaper, whatever, it, whatever media it be, to consider it with maybe a slightly different shift of awareness and just think of it as being such a blunt object, rather like being hit over the head with a club. Um, and so that's your choice. How do you react to it? And what I suggest is that yes, you, detachment's great um, because it enables you to look at it symbolically. What's it saying to me? What's it reflecting back from my being uh, back out into the world? Um, but it is a healing, and I know that some you know people are losing their lives over this. But it is a healing point 
as much as anything else. And that is the thing to work on. So individually continue, like Tammy undoubtedly is doing her own work uh, on healing and working through stuff. And this is for her as much uh, relevance. Um, yeah, yeah, but allow it to flow. Allow it to flow because like any boil that is pierced, it needs to flow to get the shit out. Excuse the French. It's and part of what's happening, part of what we're seeing at the moment, with the with the virus and the way that everybody's reacted, with the fear, and also now with the violence and the fear, this is the healing. And part of what it is is that actually, yes, it's a response to all of those healers that have been sending love and help and, and all of this. We are entering a different phase. As we know, you know, the astrologers, are, the, those that are interested in astrology, we are entering the age of Aquarius, and that is a combination of, as far as I understand it, a combination of not only the uh, heartfelt honesty between people, but also uh, there's a, an element of the mechanical being in there as well. So we're talking about um, artificial intelligence being in there. Uh, but in the healing process, we have to allow it to progress through and lives will be lost because that is part of the healing process. But if you understand that those lives are valuable and valid and have been in the circumstance, that guy Floyd has created such a ripple, it's not good. But healing is not necessarily good in that sense of, gosh, isn't it wonderful, soft and fluffy? It's quite a mucky business. And what we've got is a situation where our, our reality is becoming far more malleable, neuroplasticity, far more malleable in that sense of being able to be manipulated and to be worked with and is far more responsive and in a way, the universe has given us, has kind of unscrewed, they've, they've given us a different level of Play-Doh to play with, reality to play with. It's more responsive. And so we need to be more aware as we tread through the world and we continue on our lives in a respectful and sensitive, mindful way, being aware of our choices in the blink of an eye. It's both exciting and scary. And I do think it is scary because we need to grow up as a species. And I'm not sure we are at the moment. Okay. Any last questions? We're sort of over time. Got a bit heavy on the end, got a bit clumsy on the end. Let me know. Any last questions and we'll call it a day. <laughs> I know there's quite a, yeah. Okay. Quite a delay on the chat, so I'm quite happy to sit here for a few minutes. Um, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It's really, really important that we do try to just be as open-hearted as we can be, even in the fear. Yeah, good to have your questions, Tammy. Good to have you along. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Enjoy your afternoon. Okay, fellas, when I say fellas, I mean everybody. Okay, Doug. All right, so we'll um, we'll pick it up. All, we'll pick it up. Cheers, Ian. Let's make contact. We'll pick it up again on Monday, next Monday, the 15th. Um, I will try. I, I was going to start going through um, some of the, the house healing headings, but again, obviously, 
on a very broad brushstrokes. We'll see where it goes. Always changes. Thanks, Billy. Cool. Cheers, Keith. See you in a couple of days. Thanks, Tom. See you soon. All right. Okay. Take care now. Love to you all. Sincerely. Cheers. Bye, guys.